All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our lab meeting. Uh, we normally don't have lab meetings with 47 people, but this is great. It's great to have so many friends around. Um, feel free to turn your video on if you, if you like, uh, so that we can feel that this is a group of real people. Um, so a little bit of background on this um, topic. So we, um, in our lab, we do a lot of Bayesian decision-making, mostly in humans. Um, so modeling of how people make uh, decisions and then Bayesian models of those decisions. Um, but uh, paradoxically enough, we are not very well versed in Bayesian statistics, which um, some people confuse, but it's actually a completely different field, right? This is, uh, Bayesian statistics is um, uh, sort of an alternative to regular p-values. And statisticians, um, they uh, debate endlessly about uh, the pros and cons of these two ways of doing statistics. Uh, and these days, uh, many people in psychology are also advocating for using Bayesian methods. So people like Jeff Rauder and uh, Eric Jan Wagemakers, they're, they're pioneers. Um, so uh, we thought that it would be useful to educate ourselves on those methods um, so that uh, when any of us is writing a paper and we report empirical results, we cannot just report we can report not just um, regular p-values, but in parallel or maybe even instead um, Bayesian credible intervals. Uh, so we had a first tutorial uh, on that topic uh, last week. Uh, Ronald gave that. That was mostly about uh, base factors and uh, sort of the philosophical um, background of these two schools of thought. If you're interested in uh, listening back to that, you can just go to our lab website under resources. It's, it's posted there. Uh, today, we're very happy to have the continuation of that, but it's a standalone tutorial uh, by Gianni Galbiati. Gianni was uh, a master's student and a research assistant in my lab for, for several years uh, before he moved uh, to industry, uh, where he's now working in a video um, AI company. And uh, in the meantime, he's uh, continued working with me and uh, in, in his project, he is using uh, Bayesian statistics extensively. So he, he's, he's uh, volunteered to uh, tell us what he knows about this. And um, we're going to keep this uh, elementary. So if at any point something technical arises that you uh, don't understand, uh, please feel free, uh, please do ask because chances are that half of the audience uh, misses the same point. Uh, you can um, either type in the chat, I will be monitoring the chat, or you can raise your hand uh, and we'll, we'll get to you. Uh, so thank you very much, Johnny, for doing this and everybody enjoy. Thanks, Reggie. Uh, can I share my screen now? You should be able to. Okay. All right, can people see the slides now? Yes. Okay, great. So today I'm going to talk to you about a, an approach to statistical analyses that uses, um, basically relies on the posterior for parameter estimates. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means before we get into further details. Before we talk about anything else, I think it's probably appropriate to talk to you about um, why you're here. In any case, Thank you for coming and especially thank you to everyone who took the time to fill out the survey that was shared along with the invite. Um, this was really helpful for me to understand the audience's technical background. So it made a big difference that people were willing to fill that out. Um, so a big reason why um, people are interested in this, I think, is that frequentist tests are often confusing and there's a certain uh, lack of transparency that comes with them. So if we assume that respondents interpreted the levels uh, of confidence for this question, uh, when you use a frequentist test, how confident are you usually that you chose the correct test for your statistical question? We find that about half the respondents were typically less than 70% confident that they chose the right test, assuming that um, respondents were roughly using decile starting at 50%, except for this one person over here uh, who's completely confident that they always use the right test. Um, about three quarters of respondents, so this question was, um, if you have a repeated measures experiment with one independent categorical variable with multiple levels and a dependent binary outcome variable, which analysis would you go to if you're presenting these statistics in your research? 
about three quarters of respondents thought that ANOVA was not the best choice for a binary outcome variable. Um, and this is roughly correct, even though ANOVA is a common choice when there are multiple groups, binary outcome variables are pretty far from ANOVA's default assumption of normally distributed outcomes. Um, and even correct inferred sphericity spheric won't actually correct this. Um, so some form of logistic regression is actually a more appropriate assumption about the distribution of the outcomes, and a plurality here went for the default uh, maximum likelihood estimation approach for logistic regression. Later in the presentation, we're going to talk a lot more about ANOVA, um, how it works, and discuss how to approach problems like this with the Bayesian estimation approach. Um, kind of part two of frequent assessor confusing for many people. Um, about 70% of respondents had less than 70% confidence that they understood the test they used when they used a frequentist test. Um, I'm sure some respondents are probably also have questions like, how do I know if I chose the right test if I don't understand the test? And how do I interpret the result if I don't understand the test? In the parameter estimation approach, we're gonna make a lot of assumptions about the statistics we're doing very explicit. So this will really reduce the lack of clarity when you're approaching statistical analyses. Um, finally, many of you are extremely interested in hypothesis testing explicitly in the null hypothesis significance testing approach. So some of you in responding to this question, the most important component of a statistical analysis results preferred the fit of a statistical model. Um, I'm afraid I might've worded this question a little poorly. What I actually meant was um, statistical models for describing data, not process models describing cognitive mechanisms as I know many participants are interested in. So what I meant is, for example, if you describe data with a linear regression, would you care most about the p-value for the coefficient, the magnitude of the slope you estimated, or the mean squared error for the model fit? Um, for how linear regressions are usually used in descriptive statistics, I'd be surprised if you were actually interested in the mean squared error um, because that's usually not what is focused on when publishing and making decisions based on these analyses. So I'm assuming some non-zero fraction of the uh, people who responded about the fit of a statistical model here responded in according to my poor wording. Um, in any case, very few of you are interested in effect sizes and a plurality are interested in statistical significance, uh, which indicates that you're approaching this as really like hardcore hypothesis testing as opposed to a measurement and estimation exercise. Today, we're talking about measurement and estimation and hopefully in the course of this, I'm gonna convince you to be less interested in significance in testing hypotheses and more interested in measuring effect magnitudes. So for the rest of this presentation, we're gonna frame statistics as reports of posterior distributions. To put it differently, we're gonna treat statistics as the allocation of credibility over parameter values in probabilistic models. We're gonna start by reminding ourselves what a posterior is and how it relates to data. We're then going to review the presidential heights example that we used in the first part of the base, uh, Bayesian statistics tutorial with base factors. Um, but this time we're gonna focus on making the model we use for these very explicit. And then continuing with the presidential heights example, we're gonna uh, go to a practical component uh, and introduce some Python programming tools for posterior inference. Um, and then after that, we'll work from there and we'll talk about some um, conceptual issues and move on to further types of analyses in the back half of the presentation. So just a reminder, um, in posterior inference, roughly what we're doing is we have some existing beliefs, but we want to update them given some evidence that we've seen. So on the right side in the numerator of this, which is Bayes' theorem, as many of you will recognize, we have the likelihood, which we can roughly say like how surprising were observations given some parameters. We have a prior over the parameters where we say how credulous were we of some parameters. And in the denominator, we have a measure of how surprising were our observations under any parameters. Um, this denominator term is going to be not very important for the rest of the presentation. And you can think of it for now as a normalizing constant. Um, we'll see with the tools that we will use to estimate posteriors, we don't really see this term explicitly. Finally, on the left-hand side, we have the posterior distribution which we can say roughly how credulous should we be of our parameters given what we've observed. This is the thing that we care most about today. So to remind ourselves of what was going on in the presidential heights example, um, in part one, we asked uh, kind of the Bayes factor or hypothesis testing question, is there any evidence for a correlation between the heights and popular vote share for US presidents? Um, 
Today, instead, we're going to focus on estimating what is the correlation between the heights and popular vote share of US presidents, and we're not going to focus on testing the binary question about existence. And just to make this explicit and connect to Bayes' theorem, which we just reviewed, what we're trying to do is estimate this posterior, the probability distribution over correlation coefficients, given the data that we saw, and assuming some prior on those correlation coefficients. So um, I think it's easiest if we first look at some results from this analysis and talk about how they relate to the sampling model that we actually used. So uh, you might remember from part one, these are recreations of the distribution we saw for the different priors on the correlation coefficient. These posterior distributions and the posterior plots are kind of the, the heart of Bayesian parameter estimation reports. Note that these are um, really, these are exactly similar to what we saw from the JASP outputs that we used in the first tutorial. So on the left, we have the posterior for the model with the uniform prior from negative one to one on the correlation coefficient. In the middle, we have the posterior for the model with the positive uniform prior running from zero to one on the correlation coefficient. And on the left, we have this uh, uniform prior on the negative interval for the correlation coefficient running from negative one to zero. Um, and you'll also note in the top here, and we're going to go through this, that we have made the entire statistical model we used for sampling these posteriors completely explicit. Um, the base fact, just to be clear, the base factor results are also model based, but aside from the choice of the prior on the correlation coefficient, not a lot is exposed, not a lot else is exposed to the scientist or the analyst, and not a lot of other choices are given to the analyst in how they want to model this data. So similar to, sorry, my Zoom window is a little on the way here. Um, similar to what we saw in the base factor is that we use a bivariate normal likelihood to jointly sample um, the height and the vote data from a normal distribution. Um, the rest of this right-hand column is just deterministic transformations to construct the mean vector for the multivariate normal distribution um, as well as the covariance matrix using the correlation coefficient and the marginal priors on the height and the vote variances. So don't worry about this computation too much for now. Um, you can look up why this is the case later on your own. Here, we're denoting the prior on the correlation coefficient. We're sampling this from a uniform distribution with a lower and upper bound that we're specifying ourselves. We also put explicit weekly informative priors on the marginal height and vote share distributions. Um, I set the mean priors to reflect the data types and scales that are present in the data here, but you could just as well center this at zero with a large standard deviation if you're highly uncertain about this. Um, you also notice that for the vote share, I modeled this with a beta distribution instead of a normal distribution because the vote share will really only be in the interval from zero to one. So beta distribution is an appropriate assumption for this sort of marginal data. The base factor model, again, doesn't expose these choices, but they also don't matter that much, like I said, unless you choose really extreme and odd values. So before we talk about how to turn this model into code, condition it on data, and compute the posterior for these parameters, we need to talk very briefly about Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Um, don't worry about these too much for now. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. What you need to know is that Markov chain Monte Carlo methods draw samples that converge asymptotically to the true posterior. This means that you can do inference even in models where you can't compute a posterior analytically. For example, in hierarchical Bayesian regression models, which we'll encounter later, uh, you can't compute analytic solutions, but you can still use Monte Carlo methods to estimate the posterior. In any case, computing posteriors is really straightforward and usually quite fast with contemporary samplers. We're going to bracket further details about how these work. If you're not familiar, it's a great idea to learn about them on your own. Um, so we're going to walk through some code now, uh, again, relying on this presidential heights example. So we're going to work in a online environment called Google Colab. Everybody who has access to Google Drive has access to this tool. And I will share links to these in the, um, in the chat for the Zoom at, towards the end of the presentation. So everybody should be able to view these. Once you will have them in a view only mode, in order to make your own editable version, you can go to File, 
and then you can save a copy and drive. And this will give you a version that you can edit and run yourself. Um, the first thing we're doing here is we're installing some packages that we need. So you have access to the, you, the typical Linux um, aptitude package manager. And you also have access to pip installations um, in the Python package manager. We don't really need to focus too much more on that. Um, because many respondents indicated they weren't very familiar with Python, we're going to race through uh, some of the different things that we're importing and what they're generally used for. Um, we're not going to really go into details about how to use these today, though, and we're going to keep this brief. So these first packages are Python standard packages, and they're basically used for making certain sorts of configurations or interacting with the underlying system. You don't need to worry about these. We're not using them. These are Python data analysis tools. Um, so the first, matplotlib, is plotting tools that would be similar to what you find in um, MATLAB's plotting tools. NumPy is matrix algebra, which will be similar to using MATLAB. Pandas is, is a tabular data format, and we'll see what that looks like below. That it makes it really easy to load data and inspect it, filter it, and manage it um, according to named fields. Seaborn is another plotting library. This is similar to R's ggplot if you use that. Basically, it helps us make nicer, higher level plots. And then finally, we have the libraries that are specific to Bayesian inference. The first of these is Theano, which is a numerical computation library. It supports auto differentiation and GPU acceleration. If you don't know what that means, that's OK. We're not going to use these features explicitly today. You can treat it as being very similar to NumPy or another matrix algebra library. So a quick question, Johnny here. So if somebody is more familiar with MATLAB or R, uh, what of what you're going to present is going to be tra directly translatable? Um, most of it will be pretty understandable. If you are familiar with MATLAB, um, I think one of the major hangups will be that to index a matrix, you use brackets instead of parentheses, and indexing starts at zero instead of one. But otherwise, these statements will generally look like pretty similar. It's going to look like you're doing linear algebra by writing code. And the packages are also uh, analogous? Yes. OK. Um, they, they, won't be, they won't be syntactically the same in all cases, but right. intent and the functionality they provide is basically the same. OK, it would be, might be good if in the documentation afterwards we also say something about that. Uh, and then Tisho, did you have a question? Yeah, just um, the screen, the code looks really small on our end. Is ah. that possible to you just make it larger? Thank you. Is this a little better? Yes, much better. OK, Thank sorry you. about that. Thank you, um, okay, the remaining two libraries here are Arviz, which is a posterior check and plotting library specifically for Bayesian analysis. And then finally, PyMC3, which is a probabilistic programming language built on Theano that includes many common distributions and ways to do inference with composed models that you define in this language. Finally, we have some basic configuration. We're going to get the number of cores available so we can use multiprocessing. Don't worry about this. It's not really going to be exposed in a confusing way later. And we have a random seed, which many of you will be familiar with from your own simulation analyses. And we set that to a default value using NumPy. The data we're using is the same data set that was used for the base factor tutorial, where we have a relative measure of the heights of presidents centered at one and the fraction of the popular vote they received. I'm using pandas, which is the tabular data library that we discussed before, to read data from a URL that I posted on GitHub. So you can see this is a tab separated file. We read this with pandas using the read CSV function, telling it the separator between cells is the tab symbol. And this is sufficient to load this data in this tabular format that we see here. So you can see in each row, we have a president and their election year, um, their relative height, and the fraction of the popular vote that they received. And we have named fields and can res refer to all of these vectors of data by name. There are some NANDs in this data because some presidents weren't elected. They came to office by assassination or some resignation or some other uh, problem in the office. Um, so we drop those because we don't have a popular vote ratio from those. And we stick with 46 records for, these, uh, for the presidents that we have. Um, so is this clear to everybody, uh, the data format that we're using? Okay, 
we're going to define the same uniform prior or uniform prior model that we just discussed. And this, again, this is the one that matches as best we can the model from the base factor tutorial. The way this model works is essentially there's a sequential sampling from priors on mean, priors on standard deviations, and a prior on the correlation coefficient. These are transformed into a covariance matrix, and then we sample from the multivariate normal likelihood to estimate, to predict observations. The way we write this in code using PyMC3 basically directly matches this sampling way of writing the model. So this function is going to return a PyMC3 model that has this distribution defined on it. To do that, we use a context manager. For those who are not familiar with Python, you can basically think of this as saying, this model is now active for the below code. So when we want to sample from the normal distribution over the marginal heights, we just declare that using the normal distribution inside this model context, and it will be registered on this model. So from here, these statements we have here are exactly matching the statements that we have up here. So we sample a marginal height, we sample a um, expectation for the vote share. We also sample from heavy tailed priors for the variance of the height and the vote. And then we sample a correlation coefficient. Here we have uh, the matrix algebra that we use to convert the correlation coefficient and the standard deviations for the height and the vote share into a covariance matrix. So just so you can see, um, you're using an I to create an identity matrix the same as you might in the other matrix algebra software that you're familiar with using. Um, we do some pointwise computations to the covariance matrix. We then compute an outer product, same as you might have available in some other package. We're not going to worry about the details of why this is done here. One other feature that we have is a deterministic registration for this model. So what this does is because covariance is a deterministic transform of other variables, it won't automatically be sampled by the model and recorded in the posterior samples. If we want records of the covariance matrix, we can register it with the model using the deterministic function. So instead of adding a random variable to the model, you can think of the correlation here as a symbolic representation of a random variable. It doesn't actually have a value yet. It just represents the sampling distribution for that variable. So covariance also, or the deterministic method here, will also add covariance to the sampling algorithm. So it's recorded and you can look at it afterwards. We do the same for the, um, the expectations on the height and the vote. And then finally, we define our multivariate normal likelihood function with mean vector mu, the covariance matrix that we computed before, and the data that we observed passed into the observed argument here. And this observed is how you condition on the data that you actually observed in your likelihood function. Um, we can pause here if anybody has any short questions. Uh, so I have a short question. So uh, you are taking this particular example of a correlation between these two variables, right? And now how much of the, of the, how many of the assumptions that you're listing here uh, can be directly applied to any calculation of any correlation? Um, you mean on any data set? Yes. So in other data sets, you might not have a data distributed um, variable. So here the vote share is beta distributed. So I put a beta prior on it. More often you'd have something that's normally distributed. So you put where I have the vote share being drawn from a beta distribution, you could replace this with a normal distribution. And otherwise this would look almost exactly the same. Okay. So much of this is a sort of generic um, priors for any correlation. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I should say yes with an asterisk. As a researcher, you should always be careful about the research, about the assumptions that you're putting in place in your model. Understood. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. This is a difference with kind of how you would approach frequentist analyses, which is where the assumptions are all kind of taken away from you and buried, and you're expected to kind of just work with a prepackaged test. Um, this is kind of both an advantage and a disadvantage of the Bayesian approach because it forces you to be explicit about all the assumptions you're making. The downside being that um, if you really didn't want to spend any time or mental effort on it, it's not a prepackaged solution. 
Um, okay. Uh, so as, as far as this goes, you can define any model you like in this fashion as well. And we're going to see how to define some different models other than a model for the correlation coefficient later in the presentation. Um, to do inference with this model, we need all our data as NumPy matrices, which we can get back out of the data frame by referring to the fields and collecting their values. Then using the function we defined before, we create a full prior model by setting the lower bound to negative one and the upper bound to one, a positive prior model and a negative prior model. We can visualize what these models look like in plate notation. Um, this is a little uglier than ideally figures would look for this, but it's a good way to briefly inspect your model and confirm it's doing what you thought you coded. Um, and here we can see that we're computing covariance matrix deterministically using a correlation and the marginal standard deviations. And we're also computing the, mu the mean vector using these priors. Finally, you can see that there are 46 observations that we're drawing from a multivariate normal distribution and that we've conditioned on these as indicated by the filling in of this. So if you've seen graphical model notation before, this should be very familiar. And, and if, if, if people haven't, then uh, it's relatively intuitive, right? The errors just uh, dis describe statistical inferences. And the, the ones in the top that don't have errors pointing to them are the parameters that you have priors over. Now, I do have a quick question. Before today, I had actually never heard of the half Cauchy distribution, um, uh, yeah. but um, uh, I, the, the, my question is actually, I could imagine several other uh, plausible distributions over a sigma variable. Mm -hmm. um, does it matter? Um, anything goes here pretty much. What the half Cauchy distribution is, it's a folded student T distribution um, with the normality parameter set to one. So it's a very heavy tailed distribution that's centered at zero. The reason this is chosen. This is uh, Andrew Gelman's kind of generic recommendation for a prior on standard deviations. Um, the essential reason you choose this though is because it puts most of the prior mass near zero, but it also doesn't completely disallow outliers or surprising variables. So it makes it easier for the sampler to find estimates for this that are potentially more remote. Uh, Mike has a question. Uh, do I need to do something with Zoom? Uh, sorry, I have to unmute um, speakers. So okay, so um, now I'm unmuted. Um, would the Python code that follows be content with an improper one over sigma prior, which is the um, you know the 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 one that uh, assumes nothing? Uh, yeah, you can encode this. Um, you can write the prior on the standard deviations using precision as well, instead of um, standard deviation. And you can put a gamma prior on this. If you want to make it the uninformative Jeffrey style prior, you can do that. Good, thanks. Um, okay. So to do inference with this. So we've seen here, we're actually conditioning on the data inside the model. To do inference then, all we need to do is sample from the model using a Markov chain Monte Carlo sampler. To do this, we re-enter the model context. So we say this model is now active. We indicate the sampler step type we want to use. In this case, we're gonna use something called the nut sampler. Um, this stands for no U-turn sampler. Um, we're not gonna talk in any detail about this. It's basically a way to do Markov chain sampling that requires very little tuning of the Markov chain parameters by the user. And then we use PyMC3's sample method to compute, to draw samples from the posterior and store them in this trace. Trace is basically going to be a dictionary, which is a collection of named values associated with vectors of posterior samples. So for oh. example, um, we have the covariance, uh, let's talk about this actually. So for example, we have this correlation coefficient that we're drawing posterior samples for. That will show up in trace indexed under the name core, which we gave it in the model. 
Um, some of the other things to know about here are a number of tuning steps. So those of you who are familiar with MCMC methods will have, um, will have uh, used Vernon before. This is basically the same thing. This is the number of steps prior to actually retaining samples that you're discarding. Uh, this basically allows a sampler to converge before you start including posterior samples in your posterior distribution. Draws is the number of total samples we want to take from the posterior. Chains is the number of independent sampling uh, algorithms we want to run. We use this to run multiple samplers in parallel to get more samples, and we also use it to give us access to certain diagnostic criteria that tell us whether uh, the sampler has converged or not. Finally, for multiprocessing, we can tell if the number of cores we have available to our system, and we can pass it the same random seed that we used previously. Uh, so maybe a, a little bit of uh, context here, and this is mostly reiterating what you already said, Johnny, but uh, I just want, would like to see a raise of hands, like uh, who uh, had never heard of MCMC before this tutorial? Can you raise your hand if you had never heard of MCMC before this tutorial? Okay, so there's a couple of hands. Uh, all right, so can you, can, you, can you raise your hand if you had heard of it before? Okay, um, all right, good. So uh, I, I think that when, when I first heard about MCMC, it, it, it seemed very technical and very sp specialistic. Uh, it's, it is, but the good news is that you can treat it as a black box, like, like Johnny was saying, right? You, there are lots of smart people who are trying to work out the details of those algorithms, and you can just use those, right? Ultimately, what you want to keep in mind is the, the big picture. And the big picture is that based on data, you want to uh, determine what your beliefs over a particular parameter should be. Beliefs including the best estimate and including uh, a, a credible interval, like an, a measure of uncertainty about that parameter. And all MCMC is built to do is estimate those quantities um, as accurately as possible, right? So if you hear, hear about change and, and burn in, um, I, it's, it's definitely good to know a little bit about what that means, but definitely you will not have to be an expert in those methods in order to uh, use them. And I hope that takes a bit of the away, a bit of the intimidation factor. Uh, thanks, Wendy. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. The goal here is to show that, like, to actually do inference, you need three lines of code, and you don't need to know too much of the details unless something goes really wrong, which usually doesn't happen. Um, so yeah, this this is all it is is to get posterior samples. This is all you need once you've defined your model. Um, so we do this for each of our prior models, um, the full prior model, the positive prior model, and the negative prior model. Um, and we can see that this takes about 50 seconds to draw 18,000 samples from the posterior. So it's fairly fast in this case. We're going to talk briefly about some diagnostics for the sampler chains. These are just ways, that, things that you should look out for in case sampling didn't converge. If sampling didn't converge, then your posterior might be biased. And you can't, you can't publish a credible report with a biased sampler outcome. So there are two things to check, keep an eye on here. One is the gelman rubin statistic, which is called RHAT. And I'll show you how to look at that in PyMC3 in a second. Um, in general, you should see values that are quite close to one, if not exactly one. And all this means is that different sampling chains converge to the same solution. If not, um, PyMC3 will give you some notifications about things you can do to fix the issue. The second issue are divergences. If a high proportion of samples have what's called a divergence, you may need to tune longer, increase the number of tuning steps, reduce the sampler size, or reparameterize. Um, so same as before, we can see that for the negative prior model, there were some very minor sampling problems. We had one divergence after tuning. Um, this is not a lot on 18,000 posterior draws, so we're not going to worry about it. But this is the sort of message you will see that should prompt you to look at this kind of thing. So the same figure we saw before, we can see the overlap of all the samples here. 
This indicates that all the chains are basically in agreement about the solution. And on the left, you can see these posterior estimates. Don't worry about these too much for now. We're going to look at these in a different way. This is basically another check to say, like, did my sampler converge or not? Um, most of the time, you're not going to see anything that you really need to think about here. Um, it will, you'll, you'll know if there's an issue here, because these will not be overlapped and look basically like noise. Um, they will look like you have multiple chains, or they will look like they have extreme spikes or changes in different locations. So another tool we can use is the summary function, which we can use to inspect the gelman rubin statistic over in the right-hand column. We can see that it's all one here, indicating that we didn't really have any issues between chains. We can also see summary statistics for the chains, the mean value and the standard deviation for the posterior for that chain as well as the bounds of the 95% uh, credible region. The rest of these statistics uh, are usually not important when using modern samplers. They can be informative in very rare cases. So we're not gonna cover those today. You can safely ignore them for now. So finally, we're actually gonna expect the posteriors that we got during sampling. So we saved the posterior samples in each of these objects, which we call a trace. In order to plot these, we're gonna use Arvis's plot posterior function, which we pass the trace object. We tell it the variable names in the trace that we're interested in. And then similar to what you might see in MATLAB or um, ggplot, we can pass it a bunch of plot configuration options. Um, we're not gonna cover these right this second. Some of these options we'll cover conceptually when we go back to the presentation and stop talking about code. And we can see we're using this to produce the figures that I showed you before for the posterior estimates under these different prior assumptions. One final piece to know about here are posterior predictive checks, which are basically uh, confirmations that your posterior accurately captures the distribution of the data. This is useful for model validation. You're asking basically, was my model an appropriate model for the data? So that was advocate here. Huh? So uh -huh. um, if somebody's used to just typing core in MATLAB or Python, uh -huh and then just putting the results in the paper. This seems like a lot of work. Yes. Why would, you do, why would you go through all this trouble? The reason we're sticking with this for the correlation example is because we saw it in the base factor tutorial. So now we're exploring a little bit more what that was doing under the hood. In practice, um, you would probably not use this for computing a correlation. Uh, there's not a lot of reason to, unless you have a really odd distribution over your outcome variable. So if you have something other than a multivariate normal distribution, then you're trying to compute something like a correlation coefficient, then you might want to consider something like this. Um, in, any, in any case, we're, we're going to talk about um, regression models primarily later. Yeah. And in general, the correlation coefficient is something you can compute from a regression model if you want. But regression models are where we see a lot of the added power of Bayesian techniques. Okay, but let's say you, you, you do this and you end up with one of these blue plots that you have here. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's probably good for people to understand what this means, right? So you already uh, yeah. uh, said this briefly, but uh, what it means is the, the blue distribution indicates the belief that one should have about the variable, right? In this case, the variable is, or the parameter is the correlation coefficient. Yeah. So then you say that um, with 90%, 5% probability, your insight that, uh, that black interval, right? So that's called the credible interval. Yeah, so Weiji, we're gonna go over, um, we're gonna return to conceptual issues and how to interpret these and focus more on them a little bit further on in the presentation. Okay. Um, yeah. But it's absolutely true that like we should, like I should be reminding people that like that's what we're actually looking at here. If you were doing the frequentist analysis, you might have a credible or a um, confidence interval. Here instead you have a credible region, but it basically indicates your uncertainty in your estimate of the correlation coefficient. So you might find a median value for the half prior model of 0.387, but like you're 95% certain that that, var that value is somewhere between 0.136 and 0.61. So we actually know you're quite uncertain about this correlation coefficient. Um, unlike the frequentist version of the confidence interval, this is directly interpretable as Ronald covered in his presentation because you're, mm, the frequentist confidence interval is like kind of a particular beast that has to do with sampling distributions. This has only to do with the estimated value of this parameter. Um, does that kind of clarify what you're asking about, Widji? Yes, and I was mostly asking this on behalf of the people who were not in Ronald's tutorial. Thank you. 
Ah, sorry, I was making the assumption that most people had saw this presentation or saw Ronald's tutorial. Um, so one thing that we should cover um, are posterior predictive checks. And these are basically, we are asking how well does our posterior capture the data? This is useful for model validation. Was the model an appropriate model for the data? Did I make appropriate assumptions in my model? Um, we're only gonna cover one kind of this just to show the general gist of what a posterior predictive check is. Um, they're generally good ideas to um, provide as kind of like a, my statistical model was a good choice. So we're gonna sample from the posterior. So what we're doing now is we're drawing samples from the posterior predictive distribution. What this is, is we're basically sampling the joint distribution between the outcome variables, the heights and the votes that we sampled from the multivariate normal, as well as the parameters. We're gonna store those samples in the data frame so we can access them easily. Um, I'm not gonna discuss how this plot is produced. Um, you'll have access to this, um, this compute, like this Python notebook essentially, um, after the presentation. And you can look up these functions and why they're doing what they're doing. We don't really have time to get too far into them today. This is what we're doing with this function though, is we're plotting the posterior density on the outcome variables. So we can see in blue here, we've sampled, we've plotted the data. And in gray, we've plotted the posterior samples. And we can see that like, this is roughly an appropriate distribution from the posterior for the data that we saw. So you're essentially uh, creating synthetic data based on the model that was adjusted to the actual data, right? And exactly. then you just do a visual check whether the match seems good. Yes, so not covered today. There are ways to do leave one out cross validation or other methods. Um, we're not gonna talk about those because we don't have time, but there are other posterior predictive checks that you can do. Um, just to show what it looks like when you don't have a very good posterior predictive check using this kind of plotting is we've taken the prior on the negative interval that we saw had a really um, tight posterior close to zero. And we see that like the posterior samples for this don't really match very well with the data that we saw. So we can use this to say like, you know, this model wasn't a very good match for the data that we actually observed. So th this is just a toy example to illustrate what can go wrong here, right? Like, because yeah. Yeah. in this particular example, you would not um, be imposing this prior that the correlation must be negative. Um, but this is what would happen if you were to assume that. Exactly. Uh, okay, so we're gonna jump back from this. Um, we're not gonna revisit this example in code. Um, we will revisit other examples in code. So if you have other questions about PyMC3, um, we can revisit them later and hopefully there'll be some um, clarity later in the presentation. So, let me get it back to, sorry, just one moment. I went idle too long and it took my notes away. Okay, so um, all this posterior inference is uh, pretty dandy, but how does it relate to scientific inference? Um, You've probably noticed that so far I've made no reference to testing hypotheses as such. And I think for a lot of scientists, there might be this question like, don't we need a hypothesis to test? Isn't this like the essential business of science to test hypotheses? So in parameter estimation, um, the posterior distribution is the full report for the parameter of interest. We can consider two different questions. Is there a difference between two groups or what is the difference between two groups? Hypothesis testing is a way to answer the former question and parameter estimation answers the latter question. So uh, the question for scientists is, do you need to answer the former question? Do you need to answer, is there a difference between groups? Or is the answer to that subsumed in the latter question, what is the difference between two groups? So one of the key advantages of Bayesian parameter estimation is that it entirely separates decision procedures from scientific inference. Frequentists also estimate parameters, but they don't do so with uncertainty. Instead, they find a maximum likelihood point estimate and then compare it to a null sampling distribution for that parameter. So if you're Fisher, maybe you use the comparison to compute a measure of surprisingness for the data, the p-value. If you're Neyman Pearson, maybe you're using the comparison as part of a decision procedure. If you're doing null hypothesis significance testing by 
uh, modern conventions. You're probably trying to do a little of both at the same time as Ronald discussed. Either way, the comparison to the null distribution is separate from the parameter estimation procedure. So for the frequentist, the uncertainty that they estimate is actually built into the sampling distribution and thus the decision procedure rather than the parameter estimate. This is by design per frequentist interpretations of probabilities. In Bayesian estimation, we reverse this. The parameter is estimated with uncertainty. So these uncertainty is with the parameter, not the sampling distribution. And then we use it for, and then using it for a decision doesn't introduce any further uncertainty, nor does it require any further uncertainty. This is better for scientists because decisions in the world are necessarily certain, but our beliefs about the world are not. And this is also better for scientists because decision thresholds usually depend on intentions or utility functions or other desiderata, updates of beliefs for an ideal reasoner, as we are conceptually performing with Bayesian estimation, don't depend on these desiderata. So you're essentially uh, outlining two major differences with regular statistics, right? So the, the first is you don't do a cutoff. And the second is that uh, the interpretation of your probability is very different, right? The, 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 the first though could be addressed in re regular statistics by just reporting the p-value and not uh, cutting it off, not setting a threshold. Is that right? Exactly. However, if you don't do that, then you don't have the, um, you don't have the, you still don't have the uncertainty built into the parameter estimate. Your uncertainty is conditioned on this null sampling distribution. Yeah. So um, you're getting a little ahead. We are going to talk about hypothesis testing with Bayesian estimation as well. This is mostly just to highlight that you don't actually have to do hypothesis testing with Bayesian estimation unless you have a reason to, which is also technically true of frequentist analyses. They're not usually used that way though. Great, thanks. Um, so again, like the, the same kind of question I'm trying to encourage you to think about is how much scientific value is actually added by turning uncertain beliefs into certain decisions. Um, to put it differently, what kind of relevant information is added by making a hypothesis rejection decision as opposed to reporting the full posterior over a parameter. So like all of this said, um, I don't expect anybody here to immediately abandon the idea of hypothesis testing completely. Don't worry about this. We're going to talk about how to make decisions like rejecting a null hypothesis after conducting parameter estimation, if you want. And we're gonna go over two ways of doing this. But before we get to that, I want to demonstrate some conceptual tools that I'm gonna hope are, will help you feel a bit more comfortable when deciding whether or not to conduct a hypothesis test. And also maybe a small remark here. Huh? So uh, I completely agree with your criticism of dichotomization in science that it's, that it's not uh, actually needed and um, science is probably worse off by everybody doing it. Um, and perhaps one reason why this is so common is that language is insufficient to uh, capture the rich richness of posterior distributions, right? It's much easier to say um, there is a significant effect as a clear binary statement than to say the credible interval is between 0.6 and uh, 0.51. And the, the farmer feels more natural language. Yeah, um, you're, you're onto something there. And I, I think it's actually a really deep observation. Let's, um, let's try to bracket most of that until after the presentation, because we have limited time and I'm trying to get to more practical examples after this section. Is that okay, Reggie? Yes, sorry. No, you're okay. I'm just trying to keep us moving. Um, so some of these conceptual tools are just go over briefly to help understand how what we're doing relates to science. Um, there are multiple theories of probabilities and implicit in our approach today, we should acknowledge that we're adopting a loosely subjective Bayesian attitude. Subjective is a little misleading here. Subjective Bayes treats posterior inference as an ideally rational update in a prior beliefs, as we've said before. It does not entail that those prior beliefs are those of the researcher. We can also use the priors of an audience or we can also use generically skeptical priors. So, on the upper right here on the slide is a classical logic modus tollens argument. A and B here are logical propositions. They can take on Boolean truth values, true or false. In this argument, if A is true, then B is guaranteed to be true. If we then observe that B is false, we can be certain that A is also false. To put it differently, given the certain evidence B is false, we were able to draw a certain conclusion about A. So what if we don't have truth values for A or B and we're not certain about their relationship? 
we can encode our uncertainty as probabilities and use probability theory to do inference under uncertainty. Using Bayes' theorem, given our certain evidence that B is false, we can update our uncertain belief about A. This is posterior inference. We condition on evidence to update our beliefs. Parameter estimation applies posterior inference to statistical models. So I have to acknowledge here, this is not the only interpretation of probability. It's just a particularly compelling one for scientists. We're not gonna discuss other interpretations today. You can look up the Definetti interpretation. You can look up objective Bayes interpretations. You can look up at frequentist interpretations on your own time. It's worthwhile reading, don't have time. Um, a very loose way to describe frequentist null hypothesis significance testing is that the evidence you observe must be sufficiently strong to overcome the null hypothesis. In Bayesian estimation, we can use a prior centered at an appropriate null value. The more informative the prior is around the null value, the stronger the evidence will, be, will need to be to shift the posterior away from that null value. So there's some analogy here with the frequentist process of overcoming the null distribution. Similarly, in a Bayesian parameter estimation approach, we can make a skeptical assumption in our prior and then show that our evidence is sufficient to overcome that skeptical assumption. As an accessible example, we're going to look at the relationship between ridge regression and a Gaussian prior on coefficients. So in ridge regression, you add an L2 penalty to the coefficient to the likelihood function during optimization. As the magnitude of that coefficient grows, the L2 penalty will also increase. This is the same as doing maximum a posteriori estimation with a Gaussian prior on the coefficients. The more informative the prior is around the null value, the stronger the evidence has to be. So if we're looking down here in the equation that we'd actually optimize to do math estimation, we can see that as the variance of the prior increases, the, the strength of this regularization term decreases. And so the evidence will be rated relatively heavily in our estimate. Contrarily, if this variance of our prior on the coefficient weights is quite low, then this term will be quite large and the prior will dominate and will require quite a bit of evidence to overcome that prior. I'm pretty sure those have to be squared sigmas, right? Um, yeah, I've been a little loose in that notation here, but that's correct. Yep. Um, so here's an example showing the effect of prior informativeness on the posterior. Um, on the right-hand side, we have the same uniform prior that we were using before. This is still the presidential heights data. And we can see the posterior, we had that from before, where we estimated a median of 0.383. Um, and we have a 95% credible region that runs from 0.126 to 0.618. On the left, I used a bounded normal prior with a standard deviation set to 0.01. So you can see this is an incredibly narrow prior that basically assigns zero probability to weights that are more than slightly distant from zero. And we can see that we run posterior inference here. We cannot estimate a correlation coefficient on the 46 observations we have that's any kind of far away from this prior. In the center, I'm using what's called an LKJ prior for the covariance. Don't worry about what this means for now. There's a link in the collab environment that I will share to you that you can use to look at more information on this if you choose later. Um, what you need to know for now is the shape of this prior on the correlation coefficient. You can see it places a majority weight on a correlation coefficient of zero and places some but not a lot of weight on very extreme values with kind of a smooth degradation between uh, the null value and the extreme values. And we can see the posterior for this model. We infer a median value that is similar, whoops, sorry. Um, we can infer a median value that is somewhat similar to the full uniform prior model, but it's slipped, shifted slightly towards the null value at zero. There's a question from Perry. What does the orange text denote? The orange text denotes the amount of posterior that falls above and below zero. So you see in this 0.4% of the posterior samples were below zero and 99.6% of the samples were greater than zero. Question for me. Uh, if you, you can probably appreciate that um, the results are very similar between the LKJ prior and the uniform prior. But if you have to report one in a paper, which one do you choose? I would choose the skeptical prior. So the uniform prior puts equal weight everywhere. The skeptical prior puts more weight on the null value. So for a skeptical audience that might be hostile to your conclusions, their prior will be more similar to the skeptical prior. 
So you should try to match their prior when trying to convince them rather than your own prior. And yeah, yeah. in all of this, of course, you're assuming that your audience is composed of ideal Bayesian reasoners. <laughs> <laughs> um, your mileage may vary. <laughs> so this, this is an attempt to say, you know, people might object if you use an informative prior that, oh, the researcher is including biasing information and they can use this to get the results they want. One way around this is to use what's called an objective prior. Another way around this is to use a skeptical prior. The skeptical prior is usually actually the harsher of the two on your posterior estimates. So some people might even make a further objection that actually biases you away from true values. That's not an argument for here. So um, after all this, uh, you still want to reject an all hypothesis. We can still do that using the posterior estimates. You can reject the null hypothesis if the entire region of practical equivalence, the rope, around a selected null parameter value lies outside the highest probability density interval, the HPD. To put it differently, if none of the values that we don't care about are in the densest credible region, then we reject the null value or the hypothesis. So we can see here at the bottom, the rope in green is the region of practical equivalence. I've selected this to run from negative 0.1 to 0.1 since these are correlation values. This essentially says correlations this small are too small for me to care about for my later purposes. Note that as the rope grows wider, the likelihood of rejecting the null will decrease. So I picked this a little arbitrarily for this example. The correct bounds depend on researcher intentions. Does a point one correlation matter for your purposes? It depends on what you're using this analysis to do later and what your risk tolerance is. So would it be would it be customary to choose the rope to just be the value zero? Um, you can, in, in this version, because we're computing an overlap between the rope and the HPD, as the rope goes to zero, um, you can compute like a vanishingly small rope if you choose to. In general, right. you, could, you could just potentially just say, does zero lie in a 95% credible interval, right? Yes, you can also use that, which you see in these orange numbers here. Yeah. Um, I don't recommend this for hypothesis rejection above the rope because the rope makes explicit that we have like some subjectivity in what we consider a useful value. So if zero happens to be that value, you can make that assumption explicit and said like our rope asymptotically approached zero. Um, in any case, like the correct bounds is, so for example, if you're deciding whether to conduct further research, you might have some like risk tolerance on allocating your scarce research funding towards different um, further experiments. And the size of your rope might depend on that risk tolerance. For example, if you have lots of funding and don't have to make um, very discrete choices, you can use a wide rope and say like, oh, this was interesting enough to follow up on. If you're very funding limited, perhaps you don't want to make that risky decision. And so you might use a smaller rope and say like, it has to be very large for us to care enough about to put more funding into it. This is, um, funding's not the exact case where you would always want this. It's just to illustrate that like, this is part of a decision procedure that is a subjective procedure that depends on what you're using the analysis for. So one thing that should be obvious, but I'm gonna say here anyways, is that you should not choose the rope to get hypothesis decisions that you want for publication. Um, I, I think everybody would basically assume this, but I think you should acknowledge it. You wanna do hypothesis testing, decide your rope in advance, buy the ticket, take the ride. The best thing to do is to choose the rope prior to estimating the parameters based on the scale, the expected scale of the parameters. So also to contrast briefly here with frequentist procedures, frequentists are asking something like, how likely would I be to see a correlation this large given that the true value is zero? Frequentists are conditioning on the null value. To put, frequent, to put it differently, frequentists are conditioning on a counterfactual hypothetical. In the Bayesian framework, we're instead asking something like, how likely is the correlation to be large enough to care about given the data? So in the Bayesian analysis, we are conditioning on the data. To put it differently, Bayesian's condition on what was actually observed, not a counterfactual hypothetical. Um, the black line here, as hopefully you've figured out by now, is the highest probability density interval, which is we also might refer to as the 95% credible interval for this posterior. Um, I've chosen 95% here to match the convention for 95% confidence intervals that you see in frequentist analyses. Um, this is basically a conventional choice. You could also choose this based on your risk tolerance. So note that 
um, a narrow HPDI is going to make a null rejection more likely. So if you want to be more conservative, you should use a wider HPDI. To put this in a, a more Englishy way, um, a narrow HPDI means you care less about probability inside the rope. Um, and here we can see that for this analysis, we can make a null rejection for the rope from negative 0.1 to 0.1 and the HPD that runs from 0.12 to 0.61, although we're just barely squeaking by there at 0.126. So what does a non-rejection look like? Um, we're returning to this strongly misinformed prior on the negative interval, and we can see that the, um, there's a large overlap between the rope and the HPDI, so we say we cannot reject the null hypothesis that the parameter value lies inside the rope. Unlike frequentist statistics, and um, as Ronald mentioned in the Bayes factor tutorial, um, you can even accept the null in Bayesian statistics if the entire HPDI were to lie inside the rope. And there's a trivial example here you could consider if the prior was the uniform distribution from negative 0.01 to 0.01, then we would see um, all of the HPDI would lie inside the rope and we would, under that prior, we'd accept the null hypothesis. Of course, our posterior predictive checks would have revealed that to be a terrible model. Um, and naturally here you might also object, this is just an informative prior. Um, it assigns zero probability over here. So who would reasonably use this in their own analysis? Um, there's also a way to compute Bayes factors after doing parameter estimation. This is called the Savage-Dickey method. Um, and if you would prefer to use a Bayes factor to quantify the overlap, it's the ratio of posterior to prior probability mass that lies inside the rope. Um, we're not going to go over any code for this. It's in the CoLab environment if you would like to see it. Um, we're also not going to go over the derivation of this. You can find it in an appendix of a Eric Jan Wagenmacher paper that is um, linked to in the CoLab notebook. So to cover briefly some further differences between the Bayes factor and the parameter estimation approaches, Bayes factor frames hypothesis testing as a model comparison problem. For example, Wagenmacher advocates a two-sample t-test that compares a model with a shared name to models with separate names. The Bayes factor ecosystem often provides direct analogs to frequentist tests like Bayesian t-tests, Bayesian ANOVAs, and so on. This is really convenient for a researcher who doesn't want to have to think about models in generic situations and wants out of the box solutions for common model assumptions. But the minute you need more flexibility or don't meet the assumptions for an existing test, you have a challenge on your hands. Parameter estimation is fundamentally very different from frequentist tests because hypothesis testing is not fundamental to a parameter estimation report. Though as we've seen, you can still do it if you want to. Parameter estimation also gives you direct access to the models, so you can choose assumptions yourself that are appropriate to the data you're trying to model. For example, if your outcome variable were circularly distributed, you could use a von Mises outcome distribution. And in fact, you have to make these modeling choices yourself. This is a good thing because it strongly encourages you to be thoughtful in your analytic choices. Um, one final note about Bayes factors. Um, this is, um, so Bayes factors can accept the null with relatively high evidence despite pretty low precision posteriors. This is just something to watch out for when you're interpreting a Bayes factor. So consider a coin flip experiment. We're trying to figure out the bias of the coin. We flipped a coin 14 times and we've come up with seven tails. So we don't have a ton of data for this coin. We find a credible region that runs from 0.27 to 0.73 for um, the coin's actual bias. However, we still conclude with a base factor that 3.14, that the true bias of the coin is 0.15. Um, in this case, we've used a fairly reasonable uniform prior. If we had used a Jeffrey's prior, we would actually have an even more extreme base factor here. The Jeffrey prior puts very little probability mass in the central region. So the ratio of posterior to prior mass inside the rope would be even larger if we had used an uninformative prior. The moral of this is that Bayes factors are less informative and harder to interpret about than the HDPI itself. And if you're presenting a Bayes factor, you should make sure to include the HDPI with it. So 
moving on to go back to practical examples. Um, the most popular analysis that people responded about in the survey was ANOVA. So we're going to talk about ANOVA briefly. The main takeaway at the end of this, just to spoiler, is going to be use regression instead. So I actually started learning to do parameter estimation to avoid doing an ANOVA. <laughs> I had a complicated analysis um, with binary outcome variables, multiple categorical and metric predictors at different levels of hierarchy. So using ANOVA would have been really exhausting and made the wrong assumptions anyways. So I'm glad I'm not alone in seeing ANOVA as like a um, particularly interesting test to replace with a Bayesian method. As far as the rest of the tests go, we're going to be talking about regressions extensively starting sooner than you think. Um, and I'm going to squeeze a mention for t-tests and chi-squared tests in at the end, but we're not going to spend much time on them. If you understand regression, they're going to be fairly obvious and straightforward. So, we briefly what ANOVA is and what it's for. It's a procedure that decomposes sources of variance and examines their relative contribution to an outcome variable's total variance. In sciences, this is loosely used to answer a question about whether some variable X influenced Y. ANOVA is typically used in modern NHST to produce an accept or reject decision via the F statistic, which is the ratio of these variances. And notice here that we're asking a yes or no question, did X influence Y? So recall that Bayesian parameter estimation explicitly separates hypothesis testing from statistical inference. So there's no exact analog to ANOVA in parameter estimation. There's much more better news that you can get what you want out of regression models instead. So to see this um, and motivate the use of regression models instead, I want to review the relationship of ANOVA to linear regression. To keep it quick, um, I'll try, I'm going to try to keep it quick. We can follow up later if you have deep questions about this. We're only going to look at a simple one-way case to keep this as simple as possible. You've mostly been you've most likely been interested in ANOVA as a procedure relating the ratios of mean squared errors for different groupings of the data. Sometimes this is framed as test if the group means are the same. You can see this framing on Wikipedia, for example. Framing ANOVA this way hides the underlying linear model. And it's easier to understand ANOVA when the linear model is made explicit. In particular, the assumptions for ANOVA and the terminology about mean squared errors becomes a bit more obvious. So you can see on the right, in the terms, this term is the variance that is explained by a particular regressor. We can see here, inside this term for the explained variance, the linear model. Likewise for the unexplained variance. The F statistic is then the ratio of these. This is where mean squared error comes from in ANOVA analyses, even though it's often framed as a way to uh, basically work with the variances of the data directly. So in this case, the group means that you would see in a co conventional ANOVA algorithm are equivalent to the coefficients in the linear model under certain variable coding conditions. You can also see the assumption of homogeneity of variance and the normality of outcomes from the use of this linear model. So to review coding very briefly, if you're not familiar with it or haven't used it in a while, when we're using categorical variables in regression models, we convert them into vectors of ones and zeros or ones, zeros, and negative ones. In dummy coding, the last level of the variable, sorry, I'm gonna go for that, is um, considered the baseline. And the effect for that group will be the same as the intercept in the model. In some coding, the last level of the variable is instead represented as a vector of negative ones. By setting it to negative ones, we enforce a constraint that all the variables and coefficients will sum to zero. This is uh, basically treating all the coefficients as deflections from a shared baseline. Um, I'm going to skip any algebra here. It's a good exercise on your own time if you want to investigate it. Um, what you need to know here is that some coding under some coding, the coefficients in this linear model will be exactly equal to the group means that you use to compute ANOVA and other ones. The computed F statistic in an ANOVA analysis is finally compared to a null hypothesis that the coefficient or the group means are zero, which yields a p-value. And as you've probably done before, the p-value is then typically used to accept or reject hypotheses about the existence of a relationship. The main point of computing an F statistic is to accept or reject a null hypothesis a null hypothesis that the variable had any effect. Otherwise, f is not especially meaningful or easy to interpret. The major takeaway here is what you actually cared about in ANOVA. The hypothesis itself was a coefficient in a linear model. 
So does ANOVA actually answer the questions that you care about? If all you care about is accepting or rejecting a hypothesis about whether a variable mattered at all, then yes, it does answer that question. As soon as you ask more general questions, like how strong the relationship is, or more specific questions about what's the difference between group A and B specifically, you need to add frequentist methods or tests. So it doesn't tell us about the direction and it doesn't tell us about the relationship strength. The assumptions also often don't obtain. An out-of-the-box ANOVA will usually assume a normally distributed outcome variable and homogeneous variances. If you have outliers, then you no longer have a fully normally distributed outcome. If you have binary or ordinal outcomes, then you can no longer use the same linear regression to model those outcomes, assuming a normally distributed outcome variable. If you have a mixed effects model or otherwise a model with complex designs and nested factors, you quickly run into a complicated algebra that you have to be fairly careful with to make sure that you're selecting the right variances to compare. All of these problems are solved by referring to and carefully structuring a statistical model. So model coefficients will inform us about effect direction as well as effect strength. Models directly encode our assumptions about the data. The assumptions of a linear model are restrictive, but what if you could use a logistic regression model instead? Complicated designs can be explicitly reflected in the model by using hierarchical groupings of parameters appropriately. And as an added benefit, you only need one model. All further analyses are performed on posterior estimates for that model's parameters. So just emphasize, everything you usually want to know is in the parameters of an appropriate regression model. So let's look at some of the regression models we would actually use to do ANOVA-like analyses. Um, this is a minimum Bayesian hierarchical linear regression model rendered graphically. So it has a normal likelihood function, the same as we would expect for ANOVA. To put this differently, the dependent variable is normally distributed. To put it another way, the dependent variable measurements are subject to normally distributed noise, et cetera. These are all different ways to say the same thing. The regression equation uses the product, the sum of the products or the dot product of each coefficient for a level with the coded variable. So if you've used dummy coding, this will be a one or a zero. And it will basically select a coefficient for that level that it adds to the intercept term. And if you use some coding, then you will get ANOVA-like coefficients for free with this model. If you use dummy coding, you would have to correct for the intercept term when trying to get ANOVA-like coefficient estimates. So here are some further ANOVA assumptions that are built into this model. We see the homogeneity of variance. We are sampling the standard deviation for the outcome variables from a single distribution. We are not se se sampling these separately for each level of the variable that we're interested in. Normality of outcomes unsurprisingly comes from the use of a normal likelihood function. Now that we've made these assumptions explicit, it is going to be straightforward to relax them when we look at other regression models later. And in this way, you avoid um, the opaque post hoc corrections that you may need to make much of the time when you're using frequentist methods. One thing that we should cover here briefly is that there, um, we're using what's called a pooled prior on coefficients for different levels of a group, and this provides some nice benefits. Because all the coefficients share a prior, estimates from different groups will influence each other. That might sound like a bad thing immediately, but I'm going to describe why this is actually a positive attribute for this approach to modeling. So note that we're using a zero mean normal distribution, a weakly informative prior for a skeptical audience, where zero indicates no difference from baseline. I, this effect of this variable at that level would be zero. So recalling ridge regression using a zero mean prior is going to pull these coefficients together and pull them more closely to zero. The more data you have, the less influence this prior is going to exert. If you have imbalanced groups, then groups with few observations will be influenced more strongly by the prior than their own observations. In this way, Bayesian hierarchical regression accommodates imbalanced groups naturally. This is often referred to in other literature as shrinkage of estimates, and it makes models more conservative. With many groups and few observations, you would see all the coefficient estimates shrink towards the shared prior, and differences between these groups will also consequently shrink. As far as this hyperprior, if you set it to a large constant, it will be most like ANOVA. Um, however, if you set this to have a hyperprior distribution, 
such as the half Cauchy that we saw before, that will place most of the probability mass near zero and you'll essentially be saying, I want to estimate the amount of shrinkage that should be applied to this data set from the data itself, rather than setting your own prior on the amount of shrinkage. So um, to see some extensions of this and how easy it is to accommodate other circumstances in this framework, we can see that extending this to a two-way ANOVA-like model, you can simply add the appropriate terms to the regression equation. Interaction terms are also acceptable. If you have a continuous covariate that you would like to include, you can include the appropriate term in the regression model. We can relax the traditional ANOVA assumptions by modifying the model likelihood. So here we've replaced it with a student T. We've removed homogeneity of variance by estimating a different variance for each level of the variable. And we've also included a prior even over the degree of tail heaviness. So you can estimate the non-normality from the data. It's also easy to extend to generalized linear model regressions. For example, if you have binary outcomes, you should use a logistic regression. Doing this is easy. You change the likelihood to an appropriate distribution. In the case of logistic regression, that's a Bernoulli distribution. And then you apply the appropriate link function, which here is the logistic function. Um, this is the same as regressing against the log odds. We're not going to talk about the details of why you do logistic regression this way here. Um, in most experiments that you conduct, your data is probably not going to, your outcome variables are probably not going to be normally distributed. So being able to represent the, the an ANOVA-like model using a generalized linear model is a very powerful advantage. So we're going to look briefly at a change detection task um, from a real experiment that Aspen has kindly provided for us. Uh, here. Okay. So we're going to race through this because we're a little light on time. I will be sharing this, um, this notebook afterward, and you can inspect it on your own. And we'll have um, extended time for questions after. So in Aspen's experiment, we're doing a change detection experiment where subjects see four randomly oriented ellipses. After an interval, they see a similar display where one of the orientations has possibly changed to a random degree. Subjects are asked then to respond whether there was a change or not. The ellipses could be either high reliability, so like this one with a high eccentricity, or a low reliability, like this one with a low eccentricity. In each trial, there could be zero, one, two, three, or four high reliability items. Additionally, there are two experimental conditions. In the first, the second display was composed of ellipses. In the second, the display had oriented lines. We're going to use, initially, an analysis designed to maximally imitate uh, the ANOVA that Aspen used to analyze this data. And after showing qualitatively similar results, uh, we'll probably skip this today, but we'll look at a way, we could look at a way to expand the analysis to include an ANCOVA-like procedure. So same as before, we're going to load and format data. This is not provided on GitHub because it's Aspen's data. I've uploaded it manually. If you had a file, you could upload it yourself using the upload button over here. Um, we're going to turn that data into an appropriate format where we have the subject responses as a count, the subject ID, the style of the probe, whether it was a line or an ellipse, and the number of reliable stimuli in the initial prompt, and the total number of trials that that subject saw um, under those conditions. We're going to describe a regression formula. We're sampling the response. Using, if you've used R, you've probably seen this kind of sampling notation before. But we're sampling the response variable from the sum-coded probe style variables and the sum-coded number of reliable stimuli variables. We can see how this looks in the data below. Um, we use a, um, a package called Patsy that we're not going to go over here to produce these codes um, without having to fuss over it ourselves. So that we can see there are, for the two level variable probe style, we have codes negative one and one. And for the number of reliable variables at each level, we have um, a set of zeros and ones indicating the level or negative one for the final level that we've excluded. So uh, we're not gonna discuss this reparameterization trick unless you have a question about it. Um, and we're just gonna describe the model and code. So we're estimating the logits, which is the linear regression equation that we had in the slide, as the product of the probe style coefficients and the probe style values. We're doing the same for the number of reliable coefficients. And we're taking the dot product with the coefficients 
and the vectors that we saw that are some coded categorical levels. We do the same for interaction coefficients. Uh, finally, we use the inverse logistic function, which is the logic function that we saw in the, or the logistic function that we saw on the slide. And we use a binomial distribution on the output variables. We pass the number of values at each trial to the n. We pass the logit estimate for the probability of responding to the probability for the binomial distribution. And we condition on the observed response values. And when we display this as a model, uh, we can basically see similar to what we had before. We have a hierarchy where you're sampling these um, hyperpriors, you're passing them to deterministic functions to compute their regression equation, and then finally you're sampling the outcomes from the outcomes of that regression equation. Same as before, we're going to use the nuts algorithm to draw a bunch of samples from the posterior. Uh, again, same as before, you can see that this is done in very few lines and is generally something that's more or less push button. Uh, we inspect the trace, we're going to skip that. So in the original ANOVA analysis for this, for the proportion of subjects that reported a change, um, the number of high reliably, highly reliable stimuli didn't have an effect that was reported as significant. Um, but the interaction term between the number of highly reliable stimuli and the condition did have a significant effect. We can look at the posteriors in our models, and we can see qualitatively similar to the ANOVA analysis, we don't really find a lot of evidence for an effective probe style. The coefficient is, has a mean value of negative 0.008, which is essentially like too small for anybody to care about in any case. And we can see that the region of practical equivalence covers a huge chunk of the HDI. So we basically don't have anything we would like to say about the effect of the, um, the probe style in this experiment. For the number of reliable stimuli, um, we have a coefficient for each level. So unlike the ANOVA analysis, we can measure an effect for each level of the number of reliable stimuli. We see that these have pretty wide posteriors, but we still see a strong tendency for subjects to respond more when there are one reliable stimuli or when there are three, reliably, three reliable stimuli, and to respond less when there are only two. This was kind of surprising for me. Um, I can kind of make some excuses for it maybe when there are one or three high reliability items, maybe since only one item is different from the rest, the difference of that one item might bias subjects towards responding in favor of a change. Um, as far as an ANOVA style omnibus test for whether there is any difference between any groups, there isn't really an omnibus test in Bayesian parameter estimation, but you also don't need one because in Bayesian estimation, we can look at all the pairwise contrasts without running into multiple comparisons problems. We've already, because we've already accounted for all of the uncertainty in our estimates in our parameter estimates, and our uncertainty is not encoded in a different sampling distribution for each hypothesis about a difference. So uh, one way to see this a bit more intuitively is that to test multiple hypotheses, the frequentist has to recompute a new likelihood given the null hypothesis for each comparison. Bayesian estimation computes the posterior on the parameters given the data once and then reuses that posterior everywhere. So we can then inspect the contrasts. So this is the difference between every possible, this is the difference between all the combinations of levels um, for the number of highly reliable stimuli. And you can see that for a number of these, we find very large differences. So we can report instead um, contra the original ANOVA, that we find that the number of high reliable, highly reliable stimuli does have a measurable and interesting large effect. Whether this effect is of further research interest is um, another matter entirely. And we would do the same for the interaction coefficients in this model. So, uh, um, we can return to any questions about that um, at the end because we're running right up against the end of our time. Um, there's one other example we could go over. We're going to skip that. Um, for replacing chi-squared tests, you can also use a regression. Instead of using a logistic regression or a linear regression, you instead use a Poisson regression 
and you can notice the exponent in the link function for this, et cetera. Everything is basically going to look the same in this framework. So for t-tests, we have what's called the Bayesian estimation supersedes the t-test procedure. Um, this might not look immediately like it, but this is actually also a regression model. It's equivalent to a regression with dummy coded data and excluding any intercept term. Um, why that is, is a question that we can save for another time. So just to wrap up with um, a few final thoughts, um, there's a lot of debate over appropriate prior choices. We're not covering here. We've only covered one approach to this, which is priors for a skeptical audience that center the prior on null values. If your audience was composed of skeptical ideal, re ideal reasoners, as we discussed, how much would they update their beliefs on the evidence that you've collected? Um, there are other uses for the software that we've talked about here. Today, we've really constrained our discussion to statistical models for conventional hypothesis testing analyses. You can use uh, these probabilistic modeling tools to do posterior inference for cognitive process models, for dynamical probabilistic models, for time series models, latent variable models, and even really exotic models like Gaussian processes and Bayesian neural networks. Um, we're, obviously, I haven't covered these today. Um, ask me another time if you have questions about this. Um, for further reading, I strongly recommend John Krushke's book. Um, this is really an ideal reference for doing Bayesian parameter estimation in practice. Um, all the examples in there are R, so if you're an R person and prefer that, um, you can learn quite quickly from that. Otherwise, you'll have to translate it to the software of your choice. Um, that's about it. I think we should break for questions. Um, and we can let people who are participating decide what they would like to hear more about, if anything. Thank you very much, Shani. That was very informative. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, if not, I have one. So you described how base factors have the advantage of being prepackaged in, in, in several um, software, softwares. So then, uh, is there anything like that at all for parameter estimation, or would you say um, it shouldn't be like that? Like you, it, it should, you should actually be writing more custom custom code where you're more aware of what goes into it. Um, so I think it's generally an advantage that Bayesian estimation doesn't provide packages for these. If you wanted to do something like write really trivial packages for a one-way ANOVA-like logistic regression model, you could write a package that does effectively do this. Um, however, for another research design that includes other factors, you immediately would have to go back and edit the model anyways. So exposing the model and making it explicit is usually an advantage, unless you're doing lots and lots of very routine sorts of analyses. Um, I think in practice, most analyses are not as routine as you might expect. Perhaps we could say like the distribution over different analyses is quite heavy tailed. Um, I'm gonna quickly see if there are more questions. Ronald has, uh, has his hand up. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, so I have a question about uh, research degrees of freedom. So because this, because it can be both a blessing and a curse, right? So I was just wondering what your thoughts are about, because I sometimes already, when I talk about base factors, then I already get um, questions like, oh, but you have a prior, so you get more freedom than even in, in frequency statistics, so you can, yeah, you can run into even more pitfalls. And it looks like the machinery that you presented today is, is really great if you have really good knowledge of what you're doing, but do you think there might be dangers for, when you're not so sure about what you're doing, or is it quite robust um, against choices that you make along the way? Because it looks like there are a lot of choices. So perhaps there's two questions actually. Are there many more research degrees of freedom than in, let's say, standard uh, techniques, just using prepackaged uh, ANOVAs, et cetera? And secondly, if there are, how would you shield people against falling into, into pitfalls that might see yeah, lead to um, questionable results? Yeah, so as far as research degrees of freedom goes, in the frequentist situation, that's often related to the number of comparisons that are intended for the data, right? 
So like if you check like six or seven different comparisons, you're like, well, maybe I should an eight or ninth. Like this influences the number of positive or this influences the number of non-null rejections that you're likely to receive. Here, we don't see that when we're doing the comparisons between parameters, they're already in a model the same way we saw in the frequent situation. So maybe let's back up so we have something to look at. Um, where are we? I want this guy. Um, so for example, like if you're comparing, if you have all of these variables in your model and you're comparing different levels between them explicitly, you can do as many comparisons as you want with incre without increasing resource or degrees of freedom. Where there might be more danger is if you're deciding to include an additional variable in the model. So if you're making the decision of which model you're going to use based on um, what the, um, basically based on like how tight the posteriors are and the parameters that you're interested in, and you're varying the number of variables that you're including in your model to get what you want there, that's researcher degrees of freedom in this context. There's a pretty easy recommendation here, which is to put everything you can into the regression. So you do posterior estimation once. This, you, you're, you also touched on kind of like the role of prior choices on researcher degrees of freedom. And yes, a researcher can certainly manipulate the priors to get answers that they want. And the answer is going to depend a little bit on the prior they chose. In most cases, if you chose a weakly informative prior for a skeptical audience, your results are not going to vary too much because your prior is very, very wide and flat, so it doesn't influence the posterior very much. And it's also centered on zero. So if it influences the posterior at all, it yanks things towards a null result or what you would call like an uninteresting parameter value. Um, if you stick to these kinds of choices, then like, let's say you're choosing between an uninformative prior with a standard deviation of 10 and a standard deviation of 100. These are already so flat, it's not gonna make much difference which one you choose. If you choose in between a prior with standard deviation 0.01 and one with a standard deviation of 100, it's gonna make quite an enormous difference. The difference is going to be that it's going to basically collapse all your coefficients and you're not gonna find any information about them because you were so skeptical to begin with that you couldn't learn about them. Is this, uh, is this what you were asking? Uh, yes, this, this kind of answers it. I was also wondering if there is any, is there any easy ways to test how robust your results are against um, under under different choices. So if you do this this base vector with what, what I presented last week, you, in YASP you can, for example, plot the base vector as a function of the width of the of the prior that you choose. I was just wondering if you can do the similar things for um, yeah for the kind of test that you presented today. So for estimation in general. Uh, yeah, you certainly could. Um, there's a couple different ways to frame that. For example, you, since you can compute the base factor on these posteriors, you could compute the base factor for different priors. This might be computationally very expensive. Um, this role is more normally filled in by like the posterior predictive check process. Um, there are, as I mentioned, like quantitative ways to measure the posterior predictive fit. Um, in particular, there are some leave one out cross-validation approximations that you can use directly on the posterior without rerunning inference. Mm -hmm. um, the details of these, frankly, I don't understand. I just, I haven't looked deeply at them. I just know they exist and I accept that the researchers have done their work and proven this to work well enough. You could also write your own k-fold scheme if you wanted, again, at some computational expense. What this gets you though, if you were deciding between two different ways to model your data, you could choose the one in which the um, posterior predictive distribution has the maximum likelihood. And you're just saying like, you know, this selection inferred parameters. So this combination of model and parameters was the best model for the data that I found. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. So uh, let's thank uh, Johnny again. I'm seeing if I can unmute everybody. Um, I don't know if that's even possible, um, but uh, thank you very much. You can virtually clap. Um, thanks everyone for, for coming and for uh, s s sticking with us to the end. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, right. I'm about to um, put links to these uh, notebooks yeah. in the chat if anybody would like to. Yeah, and uh, if, in fact, all materials from this tutorial, including the video, will be uh, uploaded to the lab website. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>